Hi. 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 So, ironically, for a session about privacy, I'd like to start with a personal question. Uh, and it's a question that I'm really interested in for all privacy advocates. What is on your phone for <laughs> search, for social? What do you, for search, for social, for, for browsing, for email, what do you use as someone who is really concerned with privacy? Uh, well, <clears throat> no surprise, I start with a Firef uh, Mozilla browser. <clears throat> I tend to use Focus, sorry, I should have had some water, um, <clears throat> which is, uh, excuse me for a minute. <clears throat> That's a great start. Um, anyway, it's a Mozilla product, but it's a simplified, it automatically erases where you've been and doesn't keep things. Uh, I use Signal, mm -hmm. um, which is inconvenient. And, and, and I mean, it, 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 there are places where it doesn't work as well. Let's say WhatsApp, but that's my, my um, choice. I know Moxie. And I, I like the personal commitment to driving that product to be the best it can be is, is very real. And it's also, he was the one who did the encryption for WhatsApp. Um, so uh, I, I use Signal and uh, if someone doesn't have it, I use WhatsApp. I have taken Facebook off. I still have a Facebook account because my husband uses it. <laughs> and so like, you know, like, but, but I'm, um, uh, and then email, you know, I, I do use Apple Mail for, Gmail, actually. We have a corporate Gmail piece which has different security stuff. So, um, And I, I guess I would say I'm on the end of the spectrum. I'm, I guess I'm not that social. Right? Like I never believe the premise that everything is better social. Uh, and so I think, as I say, I may be on the extreme, but I, uh, I think not everything is better. Oh, thank you, uh, social. Um, and we're, we're seeing some of the consequences of that. Like certain aspects of humanity with sharing and excitement, those things are often better social, but reflection and understanding and decency and figuring out, oh, maybe I was wrong or what do I really think? Those things are often not better social. And so we're seeing a lot of that. As someone who uses Twitter all the uh, time, I definitely agree with the latter point that you made, that I think a lot of you, what, what you see online, what you see in these social networks is what happens when emotions and thought processes that probably should be private are forced to be public and it ends up somewhat distorting it. So when, when I was up here a few minutes ago, I talked about, I, I gave sort of a, a, a fantastical story about imagine if Facebook in 2019, 2020 tried to invent credit scores in my the point of that story was to say that I don't think we would allow it, that we have a vocabulary about the dangers of surveillance and the importance of privacy today that didn't necessarily exist in the last few decades. And as a result, we've been living in this kind of surveillance state for a while without having the same public conversation around it. I wonder whether you think what we're seeing today is a continuation of a surveillance state that has just existed, or whether what we're looking at today is truly of a different kind. Different in scope and scale. So maybe a continuation, but, but, but the, the scale and the connectedness is so much different now. So it used to be that, yes, there was a credit report, um, and one organization had that, and somebody else had your financial records, and somebody else had your credit card data. And so we had these mini collections of data about us. But the thing about the network and the, and the way things work now is that all gets combined. And so the ability to buy, well, your internet traffic, for one, we'll see. Like ISPs, it's perfectly legal in the United States now for them to sell your internet traffic, you know, combined with your credit card data. <laughs> which is bought and sold, combined with a bunch of other things. Like the, the combined profile of each of us now, I think, is really different in scope. And I think what's happening is not credit reports as we understand them, but the online modernized equivalents of those are already occurring. Like Amazon knows a lot about your personal price elasticity. Will you pay top price? You know, are you always looking for a bargain? That's part of your profile. So that's not a credit report because it's not how much credit they would extend, but it's a pricing report on your preferences or the preferences of your family. Is that so, so much worse, though? Is, is, is a digital price discrimination tool right. so much more unethical than the kind of credit reports that have been de rigueur for 70 years? Well, so you would say a, a credit report is... <clears throat> 
base, yeah, that's a, so it's an interesting question. So first of all, we have to decide if it's unethical or not. I'm merely saying that it exists, that right. when you go to Amazon, you should expect that that information and the pricing and what you see and whether you're a Prime member and when you buy and how you buy is all factored into the price. Like, I'm not sure we understand that now, where economic theory and price elasticity is a market basis, but now we're building a price elasticity of one or you and your family. So that's a very different model, and I say it's different in size and scale and scope than before because the range of things and how Amazon is often, if you don't know where to go or you're not near a store, so many people start there. Right. This, I guess, is, the, is somewhat a cliche question to ask a privacy advocate, but I do think it's also the most fundamental and the most important. What if most people just don't care? What if the reason that Facebook has a billion users, even as we're learning more and more about what it's doing with third-party data, and the reason that Google is so unbelievably profitable, yeah. and the reason that Amazon is the biggest retail company in the history of the world, is that your preferences for privacy just aren't shared by the vast majority of people, and that even with perfect or as complete as possible understanding of what happens when we give up our information and our digital behavior to companies that have the right to share it with third-party companies. We just don't mind that much because the promise of convenience is so powerful. Yeah, I think it's an easy argument, but um, it makes a lot of assumptions. So first of all, y you, the one assumption in there is that information alone is enough, right, without choice. And, 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 and that's a, um, uh, I was going to say Machiavellian, but, but I want to, but, but that, you know, if you have no choice, it doesn't matter what you know. I mean, if you need to drink water and you're in Flint and you don't have good water, like the water that comes out of the tap may be poisoning you, but your first need is water. Like you're going to drink it. So, so perfect information, that's sort of the SEC model, right? Like if we just have these million page disclosures, everything is fine, uh, but, but it's not. So I, a couple things. One, privacy I think is too small a term. I use it today because that's what people respond to, but I think it's personal security. Like where I am is a personal security matter or it's financial security. And so, first of all, I'm not sure that we understand that. Secondly, security and convenience is always a trade-off. And individuals make those trade-offs in life all the time. Like having keys to my house and my house locked is inconvenient, but I do it because that's a place where security really matters. You know, if you get off a bus and you're walking home, sometimes you will take the longer inconvenient route because the shorter route is not safe. So we make all of these trade-offs in life, but we hope to have a choice. And so if you're in a disadvantaged group, often you don't have a choice. And that's why you would find, um, uh, you know, more people you know, regularly subject to violence, as often you just don't have a choice. And so right now on online space, there, there is no choice. And so privacy versus convenience, if you say, can I actually live my life and do the things I need to do in the way they get done today or not? <laughs> do I do those things and take the risk that comes with it, um, even though I feel helpless, or do I not do them like, convenience is also not a great word. It's like, how do you actually live life today? Uh, and it's very hard to get a lot of things done if you're not using <laughs> the network. So I, I think the, the question is, is, as framed, would be, we're going to choose how to live our lives mm -hmm. if you have zero choice. So the, the question is, how do you actually get more choice in there? And sure, we're all going to make different, different choices. And I'll, I may be on the far end. Because as I said, I think I'm not that social. You know, so there's some things that I don't mind losing. Um, but but the, the point of where does a society that has choices, as we do in the physical world, end up? I'm actually, I'm really happy that you said that. Because I do think that in a lot of conversations, I, I place myself probably somewhere in the middle, leaning slightly toward the, the privacy side, away from convenience, if I was going to plot myself on the spectrum over there. But I do think yeah, in my conversations yeah. with privacy advocates and people who work for companies that are explicitly in the privacy business or privacy protection business, um, that I am often like, I, I don't hear often, excuse me, when you turn, when you can mute that. All right, cool. <laughs> um, the, uh, that often I hear people not necessarily giving credence to the idea that there's just a diversity of preferences, that yeah. even with a lot of information, you could still have a lot of people still deciding, I, 
I think the risk is right for Facebook. I think the risk is right for Google. And so you're saying, right. yes, even with better information, more people, some people might still use these apps, but fewer would. Is, is that your thesis? Uh, so, there's, so there's a couple things. I think there's individual, individual choice, and then there's some public policy stuff. Okay. So on, on the public policy stuff, I would say today we are starting to learn how you can manipulate human behavior. So we know, for example, there are some profiles about you that are economic, like how to encourage you to buy more, right? But there's some set of information that we, it's probably in all social networks, but we've seen it in Facebook the most, that is enough to get you out on the street in a rage with other people who are similarly enraged and to create controversy and violence. Like we, we, we know that, 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 I mean, we know that that's happened and that Facebook's being used for those things now. That's a different kind of profile. And that is also a public policy question. Uh, in in um, what is the nature of society? How easy is violence? How, man, how does a society choose to, pen, to protect individual citizens from that level of manipulation? The answer might be yes in some, it might be no in others. But I think we're learning uh, a lot about human neuroscience and motivation and how useful data is in causing, manipulating or causing or encouraging people to behave in certain ways. Right. Let's talk a little bit about the solution side and the role the government might be able to play. So the DOJ and the FTC are right now looking into an antitrust case against some of the biggest tech companies yeah. and a lot of people are calling for Facebook to be broken up. Do you think breaking up Facebook would be a boon for privacy? Uh, unclear. Uh, so there's a question of breaking up Facebook. There's a couple reasons for it, and one is antitrust and competition. And should should Facebook own Messenger, you know, WhatsApp, Instagram, like own the communication, the global communications channel that WeChat in China doesn't own? Like, so that's a competition question. And uh, 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 on the on the privacy side, I think it is not certainly not sufficient. That even if one were to break up Facebook, the business model and what we're learning about humans responding to anger and outrage more than other things and the power of data to manipulate people, um, others will pick that up as well. Right. And so I think this question, which gets wrapped up in privacy, and again, I think that's, the, you know, I think that's too narrow a, a, a term for it. I mean, I, I personally like privacy. I mean, I was an only child, maybe that's why. I like to be alone and I like to have lots of things that are only mine. And I feel like if somebody else gets to see them, that's their privilege. Like it's not, it's not my life. So, so I'm you know, on the edge of that. So I really personally care about privacy, but, but I also think the word is much too small for the scope of things that we're covering it. Uh, and so I think even if one were to break up the social media platforms, one also needs to look at some other questions. Right, so when I think about breaking up Facebook, I see it as trying to solve three different questions, one of which is privacy. Um, so one of which is the privacy question. One is, you know, should we find a way to limit this surveillance economy by which we essentially allow companies to surveil our behavior and then sell that information to other companies. That's one problem that we can try to solve. A second problem we can try to solve is the competition problem, as you said, that there, there's no way really to compete with Facebook because it owns the network effects of social media. A third, I think, that I would distinguish from privacy is actually the content question. I think that misinformation, you mm. know, the, the mislabeling or false labeling or non-labeling of content <laughs> that can be, that can engage hatred or just spread falsehoods, that's not really a privacy issue. That's really like a content, almost like an editorial issue. It's a lack of editorial oversight. And you're saying that the breaking up of Facebook might solve the competition problem, but it wouldn't necessarily answer the editorial problem, the content problem, or the privacy problem. Is that, a, is that yeah. an accurate read of your, of your position? But didn't you also say that one reason that we use Facebook and that we use Google and that we use a lot of these services that violate our privacy is that we don't have choice? Yes. So, so the, the breaking up of Facebook might be able to create uh, social media companies, social networks that would try to win over consumers by promising them a more private ecosystem. That is possible, right? Well, certainly in the United States, we look to the market to try and solve a lot of problems and to provide consumers and citizens with choice so that we can exercise rather than relying on a highly centralized government control piece as as. Well, we'll say we're engaged in a lot of policy discussions with the French government right now, 
which is a much more centralized approach. So yes, I think the market and competition, and also if I could wear the hat of a you know technologist of the you know of Mozilla. I, I do, I still believe in building things and in, in, in products that offer choices and in the kinds of things that you can do if there's a place in the market to compete. And, you know, that's difficult. We're still at it at Mozilla, but it's hard. And uh, there's a lot of things lined up in the market and the structure that make it really quite, quite difficult beyond just the challenge of building a great product. You know, for many years at, uh, at Mozilla, people were afraid to point out the structural things lined up against us because they thought it would sound like we were whining. You know, it was our own fault. We'd lost our magic. We couldn't make a good product. And so we were just complaining. So we didn't say anything for a long time about it. Uh, but I think it's important to say, like, making a great product is a challenge in and of itself. And then there's the market and structural issues that make it much harder. Right. So if breaking up Facebook or breaking up a company that's violating people's privacy is a solution to the sort of the competitive Well, I didn't say it's a solution. I mean, part of a solution. It's, it's right. part of a solution to the competitive to. side. What would be a federal solution that would more directly help the privacy side here? Like, what could the federal government do or what could state governments, any government body, do that would make this ecosystem of digital life safer for individuals? <laughs> Well, that's a political question, too, right? Like, what, what is your will? So, so the obvious answer, and I'll say it's on one end of the spectrum, is to look at the question, like, is online tracking permissible? I don't know. Like, if Facebook physically followed you around and looked at everything you did, would that be stalking? Would that be harassment? You, what would it be? Um, so, so that's an interesting question. If you think about it in the physical world and you say, well, is that really okay? Um, then, then you might look at that in one way. You could say that that's, you, you could say that, uh, so, you know, we, we, we have the, the question of free expression, or in the United States, free speech, um, and then the question of violent and hateful mm -hmm. content, and then even more like lies, you know. <laughs> but, um, so there's, a, we have a, you know, especially in the United States, a very strong interest in not limiting or over limiting the right of citizens to express themselves. So, so that's a problem, but, but maybe the right of a citizen to express herself is different than the right of a company to spread and broadcast and monetize and profit from that. You know, maybe the question of what is the actual engagement with the content? Like, cause I, I too, as, as long as privacy, I, I do think that the ability to express opinions that your government doesn't like is important, mm -hmm. kind of a foundation of, um, a, a, you know, at least the political thought I grew up with. Uh, and, and so, so that's, a, that's an area you, you, you want to preserve and maintain, to, not at all costs always, but, but as, a, as a tenant to be uh, important. But, but right now we have business models and the machine learning and the algorithms and the network and the distribution, you know, to computationally redistribute that and all content is profitable. And as it turns out, really ugly, nasty, violent content is really profitable. So maybe there's something that can be done on that side. Um, and I am zero tolerance for the idea that it's going to like lower profits for these businesses because safety stuff does that. I take automobiles, you know, seat belts, they were airbags, they're expensive, backup cameras on cars, you know, all of these things, either the pricing goes in and consumers pay for it, or there's an effect on profit margin. So that's going to happen. And, you know, they're the most profitable companies in the world. So um, I think the argument, I think it was Sundar who said unintended consequences. You know, if you regulate, you might get unintended consequences. I'm like, well, we have plenty of unintended consequences yeah. now, and we're paying the price. And, you know, the, like, w why don't some of those unintended consequences go with the people creating some of the problems? You know, so, I, so um, generally, you know, within the open source world, I'm an advocate of commercial organizations have an important role. Like, I, I am not an advocate that everything in the world has to be open source and everything is free and there's no payment for anything anywhere, right? Because somehow you have to create value and, and people need it. So, so sometimes in the open source world, I'm seen as being at the end because I do think commercial and the market is really important. Uh, but in this case, maybe I seem unfriendly to business because I, I think there probably is some cost in improving the state of society and they could easily bear some of it. Right. So if the, f if the solution on the far end of the spectrum is something like making tracking illegal, you know, something even close to, you know, trying to ban cookies or something, what is, 
what is, what is the moderate version yeah. of right. that argument? Because right. yeah, I, I agree that there, there are people who think, I mean, and I've, Doc Searles, for example, people that, right. that I've talked to who think, look, cookies are stalking. Cookies right. are stalking. We all agree that stalking is unethical. So if it's unethical in the meat space world, why is it ethical or permissible right. in, on the internet? It's just, right. it's just not, it's wrong, and we should try to pass laws against them. Well, I, I hear that argument, but I also think that it's on a far end of, of the spectrum. Is there a moderate version of that argument that might be written into law that could help make these spaces safer? Well, I'm going to go back to the technology side for a okay. moment and say I don't know that we know how to write it into law. Like, we build product at Mozilla, and you have to have data to do it. Like, one reason Chrome was better than Firefox for a number of years is we could not figure out how to use data to telemetry, not personal data, telemetry, the data about how the product works in a way that was privacy focused enough for us. Like, that took us years, and once we figured it out and shipped Quantum two years ago, like, Firefox is good again. Oh, gosh, Firefox technically, <laughs> like, like, you know, regained the crown. I, I want to be careful of that phrase. Um, uh, so, so using data is really important and you need it. So, so just outlawing the use of data is, is, uh, in network products is really hard. So I, I think that the, 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 more, um, uh, the solution that's more likely to really work is to have enough product innovation that you could make good regulation. You can't right now. And so the question of how do we get some competition, how do consumers send signals? You know, at Mozilla, we've seen the first signals in a decade that people are actually looking at privacy products, installing them, and using them. The Facebook container that's a Firefox add-on that limits Facebook's ability to track you around the web is the fastest growing extension we've ever had in our history. So, so there's signals there. So I, th I think we need to make some space for product innovation. And then when you see what's possible and works, then you can get good regulation. Yeah. All right. Well, those are tough questions. And I appreciate you sparring with me. So thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. And thank you.